Good evening, my brother. Thank you for joining tonight. Good evening, Ashan and Webster. God bless. Praise the Lord. We're going to get started in just a moment. Just getting a little thing set up here. Amen. <clears throat> Let's open up in a word of prayer. Thank you again for joining tonight. Uh, we missed last week. Had a um, memorial to go to on last week, Tuesday. Had a wonderful time there. And tonight we're going to um, get into the word of God, the same lesson we had started a week ago. Talking about a judge, judgmental, uh, critical mind, the, what we discussed before how so many people are so quick to judge one another without examining themselves to see their own faults that they have, but they're quick to find fault in someone else. So we're going to go right in the word of prayer. Gracious God, our Father, I thank you for another opportunity to share your word. We pray tonight, God, that something be said or done that will inspire, edify, build us up in our faith to trust you, Lord God. Purify our thoughts and our actions. Help us to lay aside every weight of sin, everything that, that hinders us from receiving this word tonight, oh God. We bind the strong man. We bind every demonic activity, every, every assault, every attack of the enemy comes against your people, God. From hearing this word tonight, oh God, and help us to be focused on you, Lord God, to lay aside, Father, everything that would distract us from right now, oh God, at this moment, and that we will have a clear conscience to hear from you, Lord God, a rhema word that will help change, challenge, provoke, inspire, edify, build us up in our faith, to trust you and to grow in grace and in the knowledge of who you are. And I thank you, Lord God, that you lead us in victory as we walk by faith and not by sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Again, thank you again for joining in tonight. It's an honor and a privilege to to still be going on teaching the word of God. Been over a year now I've been doing this and I, I just sometimes just get amazed because I remember back in my younger days, I was not dependable when it came to doing things that I would start, I would start things but never finish. I would always uh, start out a task but never complete the task because either I got bored or I just decided I just didn't want to do it. But when God leads you to do something for the kingdom of God, it goes beyond your natural reason, your own desires, and it causes you to find yourself engulfed in the truth of God's word to bring you to an understanding of the importance of the call upon your life that is not about you, but it's about him being glorified in you and through you. So I pray that you be lifted up in your faith tonight, oh God, to keep standing on the word of truth, trusting God and his ability to keep you steadfast in the faith, unmovable, always accelerating, abounding, achieving the goal that God set before you to achieve in your life as you walk in truth and righteousness. I was looking at a website um, I use a lot. It's called gotquestions.org, gotquestions.org. And in this, this passage, it has uh, a definition, also a description of what doesn't mean to judge not lest you be judged. And it says, um, as the scripture says in Matthew chapter 
7, verse 1, it says, Judge not that ye be not judged. Judge not lest ye be not judged. And it says, Judge not lest ye be judged is a snippet from Christ's great sermon on the mount. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, and Matthew 7, chapter verse 27. It says, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus turns to the topic of judging others. Sadly, the passage is one of the most misunderstood and misapplied teachings in the scripture by believers and non-believers alike. In this commentary on Matthew, Stuart Weber gives this excellent summary of the correct meaning of Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge others until you are prepared to be judged by the same standard. I love the way they define that. Do not judge others until you are prepared to be judged by the same standard. And then you, you exercise judgment towards others. Do it with humility. And that's in the Holman New Testament commentary. When Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged, he was... He wasn't issuing a blanket rule that people are never to, to judge others. A closer look at the rest of the passage illuminates the real issue Christ wanted to address. Do not judge others and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use to, in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of the speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Christ's teaching was primarily directed to believers, but the principle can be applied to anyone. Jesus does, does expect us to deal with the speck in our friend's eye, particularly our brothers and sisters in Christ. He wants us to discern sin in the others so we would help them get rid of it. The purpose of judging someone else's weakness is to help him or her walk in freedom. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12. But how can we help someone else if we're not free? We must first be willing to look honestly at our own lives and exercise the same judgment towards ourselves. When we do this, we judge from a position of humility. I love that. So when we are willing to walk in humility and judge ourselves about the issues in our own personal lives, then we can help our brothers and sisters in Christ get rid of the problems that they're dealing with in their lives by proclaiming the truth, standing on God's word, living by the word, speaking the word, judging them according to what God's word tells you to judge them by. Jesus' statement to judge not lest you be judged zeroed in on problems of spiritual hypocrisy and self-centered pride. He compared these offenses to giant laws that, that blind us to our own faults when we laser in on shortcomings in others. So we're quick to find the shortcomings in somebody else, but when it comes to ourselves, we don't want nobody judging us. And that's one thing we have to really take to heart is know that we all have some issues. We have some problems. We have some things in our own personal lives that God is not pleased with in us. In order to be able to allow God to purge us from our sinful activities or sinful behaviors, we must be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to judge us by the truth of God's word to begin to perfect our hearts and our minds that our thought life would change and be conducive to the mind of Christ. Without humility, we're hypocrites because if you're trying to judge somebody else and you haven't judged yourself he said, you're going to be judged with the same standards that you judge someone else. So one thing about, we talked about a judgmental and a critical mindset and you know, all those different things. And that's the problem with people in the body of Christ. We have problems in ourselves, but we don't want to deal with our own problems. We'd rather deal with somebody else's issues. And that's what Jesus was talking about. That Hey, you can't be judging anyone else based on what, what they're doing if you can't fix your own self first. 
So we got to get in the place where we allow the Holy Spirit to purify our thoughts and our actions that we would line it with the word of God and do what God instructs us to do based on the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So in our book, what was that last week when we started, we're dealing with, uh, let me go back to the beginning of the chapter, a judgmental and critical and a suspicious mind. Judgmental and a critical and suspicious mind. One key point <clears throat> in this lesson is to realize that until we allow God to change our thought life, our behavior will never change. If we don't allow God to purify our thought life, our thought life is going to always operate according to the dictates of the flesh, been driven by the enemy, which is the devil himself, to walk in rebellion, resistance, and opposing God's truth and his righteousness. And the enemy knows that if I can keep you blinded from the truth, I can keep you from walking in the fullness of the potential that God has placed inside of you. Every one of us has a purpose. We all have a desire. We all have wills. And God has a plan. And the thing is, we have to recognize in order for us to walk in God's plan, his will and his purpose for our lives, we have to walk in humility. We have to be willing to surrender ourselves, give everything about ourselves into the hand of God, and allow the Holy Spirit to drive us to our knees, a place of prayer and consecration where we can walk in true holiness and righteousness. Without holiness, the Bible tells us no man can see the Lord. And God tells us that be ye holy as I am holy. So the only way we can live a holy life, and the word holy is a set apart life. That means you've been brought out of the world's lifestyle, the world's mentality, and been brought into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ to where everything about you began to change by the power of the Holy Spirit when you learn who you are and whose you are. Every one of us will answer to God for our sinful desires, our sinful behaviors, the things we say, the things we do, how we treat other people, even how we treat ourselves. And we have to be willing to recognize that, hey, if I'm out of order with God, the Holy Spirit is going to convict me to get things right with God. So each of us belongs to God. And even if we have weaknesses, he is able to make us stand and justify us. We answer to God, not each other. Therefore, we are not to judge one another in a critical way. And in a critical way is being in the mindset of inclined to find fault in somebody else. So I'm looking for the error in your ways. I'm looking for how, how you present yourself. I'm looking at how you dress, how you carry your behavior. I'm looking at all these different things about you to criticize you. So I make you a suspect because I'm looking, I'm looking for a suspect, someone I can single out among anyone else that I can criticize, that I can judge. And that's how the enemy does every born again believer. You've been singled out. You've been made a suspect in the eyes of the enemy. And the enemy wants to be crit critical of your lifestyle, of who you are and whose you are to change your mindset to turn from the truth of God's word. If he can stop you from walking in truth and righteousness, he can stop you from walking in your purpose, your potential. The devil stays very busy assigning demons to place judgmental, critical thoughts in people's minds. That is a very key point and a vital point to recognize your adversary. You got to know your enemy. In this spiritual battle, the battlefield of the mind, you got to identify what enemy am I faced with today? What enemy is attacking me? What is influencing me? What is driving me? And when you recognize that the driving force that's not of God is coming against you, against your relationship, against your, your, your job, against your finances, against your health, when you identify what spirit it is that's coming against everything that God has given you to destroy, to kill, and to minimize who you are, 
then you would know how to fight your enemy based on the word of God. One thing is very important to know that, hey, we cannot fight the enemy in our own strength. We only can fight the enemy with God's word. That's why you got to get in the word of God and get the word inside of you where that word comes out of you at the right moment and the right opportunity. When the enemy comes to attack you, you will be able to defend yourself with the word of God. Amen. Amen. Many problems in our lives become bigger than what they really are because we don't allow God to change our thought life. Just like, for example, when someone comes to you and they tell you that hey, you're nothing, you're worthless, you're never going to amount to anything, you, you have a track record like your daddy or like your mama, ain't never going to do anything good, could always be, be in and out of jail, going to be on drugs, going to be an alcoholic, going to be a pervert, all these different things, the negative stuff that they feed you. You have a choice to receive those thoughts projected towards you from their conversation or to cast those thoughts down. And many times we entertain people's conversation that they minimize, they minimize your character. And the most important thing as a believer is to know that you must walk as a person of integrity and of character. And what I mean by that, you got to be a person of your word. Not only a person of your word, but your lifestyle needs to follow what you're talking about. So when people see you, they will always see you in the same facet of what you always talk about. When people see me, they always see me the same way because I present myself the same way all the time. Not saying I don't sin because I'm not perfect. We're living in human beings. We're human beings. We live in a body, and this body going to sin. But the spirit inside of you does not sin, which is the Holy Spirit. But the fleshly nature is always going to sin because it's born in sin. And when you recognize that, hey, until I change my thought life, my actions won't change, then I need to examine my mindset. What is going on in my mind? A lot of people lose their mind is because they think on negative thoughts. They think of failure. They think of belittling themselves or let others belittle them. They're confrontational. They're argumental because there's issues they're dealing with themselves. They can't handle it in their own, their own. So they got to find somebody to engage with, with the demonic force to fight with. And that's what the enemy does. He looks for a person who's vulnerable, who's not prayed up, who's not consecrated. He looks for an individual who don't know who they really are in Christ to tear you down. Judgment and criticals were rampant in, in our family. This is what the uh, writer says. So when in that case, it may be, it, it may be for you. Well, in your family, you know that certain people are always judgment and some, some people are always critical. And some people are always looking for suspects. So you got to always be careful who do you entertain. It can be something on the radio. It can be people that come in and out of your life that always speak negative things. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 through 6, it says, Judge not, that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. Then it says, give me one second. Okay, in what measure, it, it said, in what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdeth, he said, why beholdeth the mote that's in thy brother eye, but consider not the beam of thy own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull the, pull the mote out of thy eye, and behold, a beam is in thy own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thy own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote in thy brother's eye. Give that, give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine, lest they trample under them under feet and turn again and rend you. <clears throat> this is a very powerful passage of scripture to really study and to read and get it in your spirit because the enemy is what he's talking about. What Jesus was talking about here is about 
how when we, we're quick to judge somebody else, we're not checking our own self. The same thing I talked about, we're not checking our own selves, so we're looking at other people's problems and faults. But then he said, don't give that which you hold it to dogs. And what he's talking about, the love of Christ that's inside of you is supposed to be demonstrated through your life every day. But there are people who are going to waste your time who's not going to receive the love of God because the, the other enemy, they're always going to fight you. They can always come up against you because they have no intention and no motive of turning their lives over to the Lord. So when you find people like that, you still have to demonstrate the love of Christ, but don't be quick to give your pearls or the things that God bless you with to them because he said they'll turn on you. And that's how people are in the body of Christ. They're quick to turn on each other when things don't go the way they expect to go. So we got to stay in the word of God and know what the word says about us and how to overcome the enemy's tactics when he comes in our way. Humility is a mega thing throughout Christ's Sermon on the Mount, and it is impossible to carry out these kingdom teachings without maintaining authentic humbleness in our attitudes towards others. It's very important to have humility. It's very important to be humble. It's very, very important to have self-control, to know how to put a bit on your mouth and a bridle on your tongue to, by allowing the Holy Spirit to shut your mouth sometimes. Because sometimes we talk too much. Sometimes we get agitated too quick. Every time someone says something to us, we don't like what they said or how they said it to us, we fly off the handle. And God is saying here that in order to operate in the kingdom of God, you must walk in, a, in humility with the attitude of Christ. Jesus encouraged his followers to show mercy, cultivate peace, and bless those who persecute them. It is very important as a believer to know that you don't fight flesh with the spirit. I mean, with the flesh. You fight the flesh with the spirit of God. Because when you're trying to fight a spiritual battle with the fleshly, fleshly uh, uh, desires, you make things worse than what they were in the beginning. The only way to overcome the enemy is to get in the spirit. So when the enemy comes against you, you must learn how to go into a place of prayer within yourself and allow the Holy Spirit to purge in your heart the ideas and the thoughts of retaliation. Because we're quick to give in to the enemy when we're upset. And we have to have control because you don't have control over your attitude. When someone ticks you off, you're going to respond the way they came at you. I remember back when I was younger, in my teenage years, even my young adult life, I had a bad temper. You said something, something to me wrong, I, I would pout. I would get upset. I would hold it in. I would never say nothing until I got really to the full capacity of bubbled up with anger. And then the wrong person come on at the wrong time, I let them have it. And, and God had to teach me how to get out of the place of having anger controlling my, atti my attitude and allow the Holy Spirit to control my attitude. And it only came when I learned about the word of God, about this fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, temperance, meekness, uh, all these different things, talking about self-control and long suffering and all that. We have to learn how to allow the fruit of God's word to be activated in our heart to bring us to a place where we check ourselves by the word of God. So if something out of order with my attitude, the Holy Spirit will say, hey, you need to check your attitude today. Hey, you shouldn't have said that. Hey, you, 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 you know, you're not walking in truth right now. You know, the Holy Spirit would tell you when you're not right with God. And it's very important to get back in line upon line, precept upon precept, when you balance yourself out with the word of God. Not saying you're not going to get angry sometime because that's the human nature. It's going to get angry. But the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.23, be angry and sin not. So you can't allow the enemy the enemy to cause you to sin every time you get angry. And then he goes on and says, these Pharisees and teachers of the law were considered to be pinnacles of moral in integrity at the time. Jesus stopped this misconception right in this tract. He saw through that out of veneer into the reality of their self-righteousness, spiritual pride, and moral bankruptcy. In other words, they were bankrupt in their character, they were prideful, and they were self-righteous. 
And we have a lot of folks still in the body of Christ who are battling with the spirit of self-righteousness. You don't have no control over yourself. You put yourself out to resent like you're really walking in the standards and the truth of God's word. But deep within the side of your heart, you're a hypocrite. You're a liar. You're a deceiver. And one thing about Jesus, he saw beyond the natural realm into the spirit realm of a person's heart. He knew exactly what to deal with and how to call it out. You and I as believers, we must know how to recognize a self-righteous spirit, a prideful spirit, and when a person is morally bankrupt, and know how to deal with that spirit with the word of God by the Holy Spirit. Jesus challenged the people not to retaliate when someone wronged them. Matthew chapter 5, verse 39. Matthew chapter 5, verse 39. In the English Standard Version says, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So he taught his disciples that, hey, retaliation is not the answer. To love their enemy and to pray for those who persecute them in verse 44. To model themselves after their heavenly father's perfection, verse 48. And to forgive those who sinned against them, Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 through 15. So it says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And it's very important to know that the only way we can walk in truth and righteousness is identifying the issues and the problems I'm dealing with in my life and allow God to deal with it. So even when people wrong me, I'm not going to retaliate to them with the same response. I'm going to come to them in love and allow the love of God to shut the voice of the enemy. A faithful servant of God will see himself as accurately as he sees others. A faithful servant of God will see himself as accurately as he sees others. He will recognize his own sinfulness and the need for God's mercy. That's where we need to stand in our own conviction, where we recognize our own sinfulness and with the need for God's mercy, a, a need for, to, to share with our brothers and sisters in Christ his mercy. So you got to show mercy even to those who don't deserve mercy that, that come into your arena. You still got to operate in the love of Christ and allow the Spirit of God to use you when you do nothing out of a selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility and value others above yourself. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. So you got to allow the Spirit of God to keep you humble. So in our lesson tonight, we're going to pick up where we left off last week concerning being judgmental and critical. And it says, Matthew uh, 7, chapter 7, verse 1 to 6, are some classic scriptures on the subject of judgment and critical, criticism. When you are having trouble in your mind in this area, read these and other scriptures. Read them and read them over aloud and use them as weapons against the devil who is attempting to build a stronghold in your mind. He may be operating out of a stronghold that's already been there for many years. So Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 through 6 is a very important scripture to add to your library because this scripture will teach you how to judge. Not only that, it will teach you discipline on how not to judge somebody else when you don't judge yourself with the same standards. And then he says the enemy operates sometimes with the weapons of, of this, this, this spirit out of a stronghold. He, he plants in your mind of something that's already been there. And many people in the body of Christ operate out of a stronghold every day, and they don't recognize that it's the enemy that's using that stronghold to keep you from advancing in the kingdom of God. The enemy knows if I can stop you from pursuing the things that God has for you to do in your spiritual life to cause you to grow in your calling and your purpose he has for you, he'll blind you from the truth that you will not see your own error of your ways so you keep on being critical and judgmental towards somebody else. So the scripture says, do not judge and criticize and condemn others so that you may not be, so, so that you may not be judged and criticized and condemned yourself. 
For just as you judge and criticize and condemn others, you will be judged and criticized and condemned in, the, in accordance with the same measure you use to deal out to others. It will be dealt out again to you. So what you reap is what you're going to sow. So if you sow, you're going to reap. You reap, you're going to sow. So if I sow corruption, I'm going to reap corruption. If I sow malice, I'm going to reap malice. If I sow love, I'm going to reap love. If I sow gentleness and peace, I'm going to reap gentleness and peace. So whatever I sow out of my life is what's going to come back to me. So if I sow into somebody else's life, whatever God tell me to do, God says you're going to reap the same benefit of what you sow. Sowing and reaping does not apply only to agricultural and financial realm. It also applies to the mental realm. We can sow and reap an attitude as well as a crop of investments. So if I sow to my mental attitude, the righteousness of God's word, his truthfulness, guess what's going to happen? The attitude is going to change in me. I'm going to have the mind of Christ. My responses and behavior begin to change as I walk by faith and not by sight. One pastor I know often says when he hears that someone has been talking about him in an unkind or un in a judgmental way, he asks himself, are they sowing or am I reaping? Many times we're reaping in our own lives what we have previously sown into the life of another. So in other words, sometimes when people are judging and criticizing you, you need to ask yourself a question. Am I reaping? Or am I sowing? Are they sowing into my life? And I'm reaping what I sow, what they sow? Or am I reaping something that I sow and what I had put out in my own life at one time or another? So I have to be careful of what's happening in my life and with the law, the law principle of sowing and reaping. Because if you sow corruption in your past life before you came to Christ, guess what? There's still consequences. God still shows you mercy, He still gives you compassion. But there's still judgment comes upon our lives because of the previous relationship. And there are some people now are still reaping from what they sowed years ago, but yet God gives them the grace to carry them through the judgments. Not only that, he used it as a tool to build you up in your faith and to build your character and to build your identity. So what we sown in our past lives, you may be a drug addict, prostitute, pimp, liar, thief, doesn't matter what it is. You're still going to reap what you sow. It's a natural law that's in the world, the principle of sowing and reaping. So you're going to sow, you're going to reap what you have sown throughout your life. But because of God's mercy, he shows you mercy, he carries you through it all, and he perfects everything that's concerning your life. And not only that, the most important thing, he forgave you. He forgave us of all our sins and our iniquities. He not held, did not hold anything against us that we've done in the past. He washed us in the blood of the Lamb. And because he washed us in the blood of the Lamb, we have been cleansed and sanctified by the Holy Spirit through the blood of the Lamb. So why do you stare from without at the very small particles that's in your brother's eye and do not become aware of and consider the beam of timber that's in thy own eye? This is the Amplified Version. Or how can you say to your brother, let me get the tiny particle out of your eye when there's a beam of timber in your own eye? You hypocrite, first get the beam of timber out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the tiny particle out of your brother's, brother's eye. The devil loves to keep us busy. The devil loves to keep us busy, mentally judging the faults of others. That way, we never see or deal with what is wrong with us. The devil loves to keep us busy judging somebody else. And we have to be careful when I begin to judge somebody else of what I feel, what I think about them, because you're condemning yourself. We cannot change others, only God can. We cannot change ourselves either, but we can cooperate with the Holy Spirit and allow him to do the work in us. Step one to any freedom. However, it's the face, the truth, the Lord is trying to show us. In order for us to change 
from a judgmental and a critical and a suspicious mindset is to face the truth that we all have some problems and to be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to deal with the issue in your life. When we have our thoughts and conversation on what is wrong with everyone else, we're usually being deceived about our own conduct. That's a very great point. When we have our thoughts and conversation on what is wrong with somebody else, we are usually being deceived by our own conduct. Therefore, Jesus commands that we are not to, not to concern ourselves with what is wrong with others when we have much wrong with ourselves. Allow God to deal with you first, then learn the scriptural way of helping your, your brother grow in the Christian walk. So allow God to deal with the issue in your life, and then God will give you wisdom, give you understanding. He will lead you on how to be spiritually helpful to your brother or sister in their Christian walk. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6 do not give that which holy, the sacred thing to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before for hogs, lest they trump upon them with their feet and turn and tear your pieces. I believe the scripture is referring to our God-given ability to love each other. If you and I have the ability and command from God to love others, but instead of doing that, we judge and criticize them, we have taken the holy thing, love, and cast before dogs and hogs and demon spirits. We have opened a door for them to trample on holy things and turn and tear us into pieces. That's what the enemy does. When we don't operate in love, we give our power over to the enemy and his demonic forces to come and wreak havoc in your life and cause confusion in your life. The reason why so many people in the body of Christ get confused, they have mental torment, they can't sleep, they restless, is because you open up a breach for the enemy to come into your life to wreak havoc in your life. And when you recognize what it is, then you need to bind the strong man and cast that spirit out and loose the power of the Holy Spirit into your heart, into your mindset to, str to strengthen you and empower you to bring you back to the place of right standing and right relationship with God. Amen. Hallelujah. So our writer says, when I became pregnant with our fourth child, I was a Christian filled with the Holy Spirit, called to ministry and a diligent Bible student. I had learned about exercising my faith for healing. Yet during the three months of pregnancy, I was very, very sick. I lost weight and energy. I spent most of my time lying on the couch, nauseated and so tired I could barely move. This situation was really confusing to me since I had felt wonderful during my other three pregnancies. I hadn't known much about God's word then, even though I was in church and did not actively use my faith for anything. Now I was very familiar with God's promises and yet I was sick. And no amount of prayer to God or resisting the devil was removing the problem. How many times have you felt like that? You know God's word. You got faith in God's word. It's like the more you pray, the worse things get in your life. And God knows what's going on in our lives. And sometimes when we're praying, it seems like God is an answer. God will answer. He answers his own timing. And sometimes God will allow us to be in situations to test your faith and to challenge you to grow. But if you're not willing to grow, you'll stay in the same situation long than God intended. So, so she goes and says, one day as I lay in bed, to my, uh, listening to my husband and children have a good time in the backyard, I aggressively asked God, what's in the world wrong with me? And why am I so sick? And why am I not getting well? The Holy Spirit prompted me to read Matthew chapter 7. I asked the Lord what, the, what that passage had to do with me and my health. I, felt, I kept feeling that I should read it again and again. And finally, God opened my remembrance to an event that had taken place a, a couple of years earlier. Check this out. I had led and taught a Bible study 
uh, I, I said, I taught a home Bible study to which a young lady came whom we will call Jane. Jane attended the course faithfully until she became pregnant. But then it became very difficult for her to join us regularly because she was always tired and feeling bad. As I lay in my bed that day, I recalled that another Christian sister, sister and I had talked and judged and criticized Jane because she just, she, she just would not press through her circumstances and be diligent in coming to the Bible study. Whenever we offered to help her in any way, we just, we just formed an opinion that she was a weakling and was using her pregnancy as an excuse to be lazy and self-indulgent. Isn't that something? How we can judge somebody else concerning their circumstance and situation and, and we criticize them, we ridicule them, we mock them, we talk about them. And then when God allows something to happen to us, and we don't get better. We don't think about the reason what we, why we, the way we are. And this is what she's talking about. She had to reflect in her mind a couple of years earlier of something she did with somebody else to judge somebody else. And the same law of sowing and reaping was a principle applied to her life because the same thing she talked about, the one about being pregnant and being tired and always uh, couldn't come to the Bible study, all that things, the very same thing came upon her when she found herself in the same way, always sick and tired. So, she said, we just formed an opinion that she was a weakling and was using her pregnancy as an excuse to be lazy and self-indulgent. Now I was in the same set of circumstances that Jane had been two years earlier. God showed me that although I had been healthy during my first three pregnancies, I had opened a huge door for the devil by my judgment and criticism. You hear that? We opened the door will become judgmental and criti critical towards somebody else. I had taken the pearls of a holy thing, my ability to love Jane, and thrown it before the dogs and hogs, and now they had turned and were their tearing me in pieces. I can tell you I was quick to repent, and as soon as I did, my health was restored, and I was fine throughout the remainder of my pregnancy. That is so powerful, because the key, when you recognize that you opened up the breach, you opened up a door for the enemy to come into your life, to wreak havoc in your life, to rip you to shreds, is to get to the place of identifying what the issue is, repent of that thing, and watch God restore you. From this incident, I learned an important lesson about the dangers of judging and criticizing others. I would like to be able to say that after that experience, I never made another mistake of that nature. But I am sorry to say that I made many, many such mistakes since then. Each time God had to deal with me for which I am grateful for. So we got to get to a place we recognize, hey, you know what? I was judgmental. I was criticizing somebody else and repenting that thing and, and let, let God purify your thoughts and your actions. We all make mistakes. We all have weaknesses. The Bible says that we are not to have a hard-hearted, not to be hard-hearted, or have a critical spirit towards each other, but instead to forgive one another and show mercy to one another, just as God, for Christ's sake, has done for us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. We got to show mercy and forgive one another. So if you wrong somebody, you need to make it right. Go make amends to the individual. Ask them to forgive you. Forgive yourself. And watch the blood of Jesus cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 1 John 4, uh, uh, 1, 9, 1 John 1, 9 says, We confess our sins. He is faithful and just. Forgive us our sins and to cleanse from all unrighteousness. Therefore, you have no excuse or defense or justification, O oh man, who are, whoever, it's a whoever you are who judges and condemns another. 
For imposing as judge and passing sentence on another, you condemn yourself. Because you who judge are habitually practicing the very same thing that you censor and denounce. Romans chapter 2 verse 1. Romans chapter 2 verse 1. So the same way you're judging somebody else, it says you're doing the same thing. And we got to be careful the words we allow to come out of our mouth. Because a lot of times we curse our own self. We stop our blessings from flowing in our lives because of a, a judgmental mentality. In the New Living Translation, it says like this. You may think you condemn such people, but you are just as bad. And you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do the very same things. So we got to be careful that we don't fall into this type of mindset of the enemy, of criticizing and judging one another. Because the same thing we're doing to them, God says is being done to you. In other words, the very same things we judge for others, we do ourselves. The Lord gave me a very good example to help me understand this principle. I was pondering why we would do something to ourselves and think it was perfectly all right. But judge someone else who does it. He said, Joyce, look at yourself through the rose-colored glasses. But you look at everyone else through a magnifying glass. He said, Joyce, you look at yourself through a rose-colored glasses, but you look at everyone else through a magnifying glass. We make excuses for our own behaviors, but when someone else does the same thing we do, we are often uh, merciless. Doing unto others as we want them to do unto us, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, is, good, is a good life principle that will prevent a lot of judgment and criticism if allowed or if we follow it. A judgmental mind is an offshoot of a negative mind. A judgmental mind is an offshoot of a negative mind. Thinking about what is wrong with an individual instead of what is right. And that's what we do. We think about what's wrong with somebody else instead of thinking what's right with the individual. So be positive, not negative. Be positive and not negative. Others will benefit, but you will benefit more than anyone else. When we be positive and not negative. And that's one thing God had to deal with me a long time ago myself is being, being negative towards other people. Try to always see the good in somebody else. Even if you know that person is a person that, that always keep up trouble, you know that person always Confucius, a person always like to be argumental, all these different things that they do. He says, allow yourself to always try to find the good in somebody else and be merciful and compassionate because it could be you in their shoes. But because of the grace of God, he covered you, he protected you, he shielded you from the very same thing that someone else is going through in their life. Amen. Guard your heart. Guard and keep your heart with all villages. And above all that you guard, for out of it flows the springs of life. So it's very vital to our Christian growth in our Christian walk, in our maturity level, is to learn how to guard our hearts. Because when you guard your heart, you allow the Holy Spirit to govern, guide, and lead you in the way of truth, the way of righteousness, to perfect the things that concerns you. The, in the New Living Translation, it says it like this. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines, it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above all of, above what? Over everything that goes on that matters in your life. Guard your heart above it all. For it determines the course of how your life is going to go. If you don't guard your heart, the enemy will determine how your life is going to go. And that's what God is trying to warn us tonight, the importance of guarding our hearts. Because when you guard your heart, 
You won't have a judgmental mindset toward other people. You won't be critical towards other people. You won't make them suspects. You won't be negative. You will always be a person that's want to be confrontational, argumental, always putting folk down, backbiting, gossiping, all these different things. And what he says, when you guard your heart, these things will have no power over you. But the Holy Spirit inside of you will lead, guide, and govern, and direct the course of your life in the way God has set before you to walk in truth and to walk in integrity, to walk in character, to walk in righteousness, to walk upright with God. And it's very important to recognize when you look in the mirror, what do you see? When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Am I seeing Christ revealed through me or am I seeing the enemy revealed through me? Because one or the other is going to reflect an image in your life. And it's up to you to determine which image is going, to, is going to choose the course of my life, the enemy or God. And I have to make a decision in myself that I will walk in righteousness every day. I will grow in grace. I will study the word of God. I will get the word inside of me. I will allow the word to sprout roots in my heart, to change my thought life, change my actions, change my attitude, change my conversation. Because we cannot Go to heaven with all this garbage in your heart. We got to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to cleanse us from sin and iniquity, and to sanctify us by the power of the Holy Spirit through the blood of the Lamb. Amen, amen. I, I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. We're going to continue this on next week. I pray that something has been said that will encourage you to get in the Word of God. If you don't have this book, get this book, The Battlefield of the Mind. I tell you, when you read this book, this book is going to make you think. Not only going to make you think, it's going to challenge you to change your thinking. Because one thing about God's Word, He's not going to speak a word to you that's not going to bring conviction. When God speaks His Word into our lives, He convicts us with a purpose to change us. But sometimes we get convicted and we run away from God and go deeper and deeper into our sinful nature. But God's word will bring conviction by the power of the Holy Spirit will bring you to repentance. And when it brings to repentance, it brings you back to the right relationship with God. So again, I thank you for joining tonight. Lord God, I thank you for this word. I pray that something is said or done, God, that will inspire, encourage us to study your word, to know who we are and whose we are, the life we're living, to examine our hearts, to see, Father God, the things in our heart that's not of you, and allow you to purge it out of us. Purify us, O oh God, by the fire of your spirit, and allow us, O oh God, to be transformed from the mindset of the world to the mind of Christ on a daily basis that we guard our hearts, O oh God, and, and be careful of what we entertain and who we entertain in our lives that we're not allowed to feed negative spirits into us, O oh God, but that we be on guard to stand against the wiles of the devil. Help us to be clothed in the full armor of God as we stand on your word and decree your word over ourselves, over our family, over our children, God, that we walk by faith and not by sight in the promises of your word and being daily clothed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you don't know the Lord and Savior tonight as your personal Savior, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I ask you to come into my heart, forgive me for my sins, wash me in the blood of the Lamb, and be my Lord and Savior, and fill with the Holy Spirit to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. The whole host of heaven rejoice over one sinner that came to the Lord than the 99 that's already been there. So I pray that you stay encouraged. Keep the word in your heart, in your mouth. Speak the word over your family. Speak the word over your children. Speak the word over yourself, over your health, over your mindset. Because anything the enemy brings against you does not have power 
to attack you until you give it the power to do so. And one thing about it, we can entertain the thoughts of the enemy or we can reject the thoughts of the enemy. And I guarantee when you reject his thoughts, you will live a fruitful and abundant and a bountiful life in the presence of the Lord. God bless you. May you all have a great night. Stay excited about Jesus. Know that Jesus loves you. And I love you too. Until next week, share this video with someone else. And I pray that continue to inspire somebody else to hear this word as well. To change their thinking. And cause their lives to be transformed. To be more like Christ. Have a good night. Shalom. Peace be unto you.